<clears throat> Hello and welcome to a special program, a partnership between the Hagen History Center, the Erie Civil War Roundtable, and the Jefferson Educational Society. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the Vice President at the JES and am a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. The topic of this special program, General George Gordon Meade, overlooked by history and those outside of academia, overshadowed by Ulysses S. Grant, shunned by the press. Meade, Pennsylvania's forgotten hero, deserves to be recognized for his victory at Gettysburg, and his command of the Army of the Potomac longer than any other general. So our presenter, historian and educator, Mr. Jeff Sherry argues. But before we get to a fuller introduction of our presenter and his presentation, a few programmatic reminders. Since this program is first airing live on both the JES and Hagen History Center Facebook pages, we'll work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section below. If you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, still send us your questions. Keep engaged in this conversation and keep it going. And of course, for more information about upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, please visit jeserie.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For more information on the Hagen History Center, please visit eriehistory.org and find them on the social platforms too. Now I'd like to introduce the guest who's no stranger to the JES stage and digital programming who will introduce this program's presenter. Now you may know him from his presentations on the Civil War and Erie history, or on the Cuban Missile Crisis, or on corrupt and contentious presidential elections, and or you may know him as the Executive Director of the Hagen History Center. Mr. George Deitch has co-founded several historical organizations related to the Civil War and the War of 1812 in Erie, Pennsylvania. He's also helped create the flagship Niagara League, which played a central role in the reconstructing uh, of the U.S. Brig Niagara and the creating uh, of the Erie Maritime Museum. He is a prolific presenter and has been published in numerous journals and has served as a consultant to National Geographic magazine for its Civil War sesquicentennial issue. It is my pleasure to kick things over to Mr. George Deitch, uh, here for this program in partnership, who will now introduce his colleague, Mr. Jeff Sherry. George, thanks for joining us for this program. Thank you very much, Ben, for the introduction. And um, I'd like to uh, welcome all those who are watching tonight. And uh, I'll introduce Jeff. Um, I've known Jeff for many years. As a matter of fact, I think going all the way back to when he was in college. Um, he is now the uh, museum educator at the Hagen History Center. And he's been with us since 2017. He, he holds both bachelor's and master's degrees in history from Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. He's a retired public school teacher um, with over 20 years in the schools. He's a lifelong passion for history, especially the Civil War. He's the author of an article, uh, The Terrible, in uh, and I'm gonna blow this word for some reason. Jeff. The Terrible Impetuosity of Pennsylvania Reserves at Gettysburg. Sorry that was a quote that was uh, used for their charge. And Jeff has spoken uh, to many, many um, historic groups and tours. Um, uh, this program is, um, uh, oh, wait, let me finish up with Jeff. Um, besides his uh, teaching background, um, he's written multiple um, articles and manuals. Um, he writes a regular blog for the Historical Society's website. He is a former reenactor living historian. He helped found the ship's company of the U.S. Brig Niagara, and um, which is the official living history group of, of the Niagara League. Um, he's been active in uh, reenacting the Civil War, World War II. He's passionate about baseball, um, coaches Little League, junior, um, uh, junior American Legion teams, uh, coaching his son. And um, he, as all of us do, enjoys uh, reading history and visiting uh, historic sites and museums. So uh, with that, um, introducing uh, Jeff, uh, again, this program is in partnership with the Civil War Roundtable, the Hagen History Center, and the Jefferson Educational um, Society. So Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, George. Um, the title, Forgotten Pennsylvania Forgotten Hero is somewhat dis, uh, incorrect. Uh, he is forgotten by the average person. George and I both know guides at Gettysburg who have said, asked them, where was General Grant's headquarters? And their answer very flippantly is, 
about a thousand miles west of here at Vicksburg, because Grant was not at Gettysburg. Um, we even have a brochure or a, from the Civil War Centennial, I think, George, that has Grant about Gettysburg. It has Grant and Lee's picture on it, which is, uh, you know, people expected Grant because we know Grant. We'll talk quite a bit about that. So um, in the Civil War, uh, the Civil War field, people who study the Civil War, meat is, is definitely not forgotten, especially uh, to us Pennsylvanians. So tonight, hopefully we can spread a little uh, truth and uh, bring him maybe out of the out of the shadows just a little bit. George Meade was the son of an American who was working as a contractor in Spain uh, for the US government. And he was born December 31st, 1815 in Cadiz. Um, his father expected a large sum of money from the government, which never came through. So when the family returned to the United States, uh, Meade would do what penniless people, and he, he referred to himself as penniless, did and that was go to the West to West Point. He obtained an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he attended from 1831 to 1835. He graduated um, 19th in a class of 56. So he's toward the top, uh, but he soon he West Point held no glamour for me. He he didn't fall into the, uh, the military is wonderful mode as many officers do. Um, his uh, assigned army commission as a civil engineer. And if you know anything about West Point in the 19th century, the top graduates went into the engineers. The second level went to the artillery. The cavalry and artillery or cavalry and infantry came last. So the scientific wings, the artillery and the engineers got the uh, got the top graduates. So Meade became a military engineer. He will be assigned to the third US infantry, US, excuse me, US artillery. And but he resigned his commission um, in 1836 and <clears throat> worked on various uh, lighthouses, harbor projects, river projects throughout the United States, but he, he didn't really care for the military much in his early days. Now, this is his wife, Margaret, and I have seen Margaret Sergeant Meade. I've seen some references to her as Marguerite, but uh, most of the accounts call her Margaret, and I'll talk more about Margaret later. They will have seven children. One of their children, George, will be on his staff. General Meade's staff at Gettysburg and throughout the rest of the war. It pays to know somebody. But he had been also an officer at West Point, a uh, graduate of West Point, though he apparently didn't do nearly as well as his father did. Meade worked on some railroad surveys in Alabama and Georgia, um, surveyed the Mississippi River, assistant engineer on the Texas border, uh, Canadian uh, American border crossing. But he resigned his commission in 1836 and hoped to work as a civil engineer. Well, apparently that didn't go so well as far as financial finances go. So he uh, was recommissioned in 1842 in the United States Army. Now, he had spent some time in Florida um, during the Seminole Wars, but he apparently got yellow fever and spent most of his time recuperating. So he didn't see much going on down there in Florida. And in the Mexican War of 1846-48, uh, he was on the engineering staff and he saw action at various act, uh, battles such as um, Palo Alto, Rosaca de la Palma, Monterey. And um, he, he's, he did well. Um, he was a little bit overshadowed by some of the other officers on that staff, such as uh, Robert E. Lee, George McClellan uh, were there. Uh, 1843-45, he worked on a Delaware lighthouse. This is the lighthouse, one of the one of his lighthouses in the Florida Keys, um, the Rebecca Shoal lighthouse. Now, these are made; they look like a spider or um, something from a bad 1950s monster movie, but they're made by these these really heavy pylons are brought out by a boat or barge that has a hole in the bottom. 
and then the pylons are sunk and then using a wench, the pylons are, are wenched into place until they take hold of the seafloor bottom. Uh, a lot of these lighthouses that he would have worked on would have involved having to uh, prepare the ground on the shore for such a lighthouse, such a structure. And, and he also was involved in making these, some of these beautiful tall land lighthouses that we picture. Now, what will bring George Mead obviously to fame is the Civil War. The bombardment of Fort Sumter in April of 1861. He resumed his, he had, he, had, he had been resuming his engineering work, but with the outbreak of the Civil War, he will be promoted to captain prior to the war, but then at the outbreak of the war, he's promoted to Brigadier General um, in the volunteers. Now there's a distinction between being promoted as a volunteer during the Civil War and being promoted in the regular army because a lot of these uh, officers will revert back to previous ranks after the war. But Meade, by the time the war ends, is a major general in the, in the United States Army. So he, he's in a very select group. Now, what happens that gets Meade's first action? And this is a topic that George knows is near dear to my heart because of my great, great grandfather serving in this division is the formation of the Pennsylvania Reserves. Pennsylvania, uh, like all the Northern states had a quota placed on it and they wanted to um, fill that quota, which I believe was 10 regiments, but the volunteers filled it up so fast and there were more men who wanted to enlist that Governor Andrew Curtin, a Republican seen here on the, on the right, decided he would form the Pennsylvania Volunteer Reserve Corps. Now that makes them sound like they were reserve troops or militia, nevertheless, Pennsylvania. That's not true. They will see combat right at the beginning of the war. Um, and they, they liked the name. It made them, it made them special. And they're one of the, one of the few divisions, whole divisions from one state in the Union Army. Chosen to command the Pennsylvania Reserves on the left is George McCall, George Archibald McCall who had been the Inspector General of the United States Army. So you start off with a regular in charge. And Curtin didn't want to lose these officers. You got 13 regiments of infantry and artillery, one of artillery, one of cavalry. That's a lot of political weight that you have. And of course, the governor appoints colonels. So you've got a lot of political patronage that goes into this. So McCall, old regular, put in charge. He's 62. Um, old by that, by the 19th century standards, not so much maybe today. Look at this lineup. <clears throat> these are the three original brigade commanders on the left. Look, these guys will all be big names in the Civil War in just, in just a, a year and a half, two years. John Reynolds will command the first brigade of the Pennsylvania Reserves, George Meade, the second brigade, and Edward Ortho Cresap Ord will command the third brigade, the original three commanders. Um, he went by Ed, by the way. And then after Ord will leave and will go west, he was replaced by Truman Seymour, who interestingly enough, was at Fort Sumter when it was bombarded. He comes from a background where he, he was you know, in, in the old regular army. And, and so we've got, We've got regular officers in command of these volunteers. So the, the unit starts off with, they have a great, a great basis to start with, with these three, later four, counting Seymour. Now their first battle is not much by standards, later standards. Only one brigade is involved, uh, Ord's Brigade, December 20th, 1861. The Battle of Grainsville. Audience, raise your hand if you ever heard of Grainsville. Um, George has, yeah. I've included this little map that was done uh, of it and this photograph, which is the reenactment group of the 9th Pennsylvania Reserves. And it's shown here in the cornfield at Antietam. And the reason I included this is because the reserves were so proud of their small victory at Grainsville that the only battle name, the Ninth Reserves put on their colors was Drainsville. 
Now, what was Drainsville quickly? It was a reconnaissance up the Potomac um, and they fought Jeb Stewart, who had a combined infantry and uh, somewhat some cavalry there, and they won. They drove Stewart away. Now, today, we don't think much of it, but Drainsville then was hailed as possibly the first Union victory. Remember, it comes on the, on the heels of Ball's Bluff, the disaster not far from, from Drainsville, in which a Union force had been driven back to the river and gloriously defeated. So, the reserves were rightly proud of this, that this was their first victory. <clears throat> the night or next day after the battle, Reynolds and Meade and Ord got together and Reynolds and Meade asked Ord, how did they do? Mean the volunteer troops. You have regular, regular officers now in charge of Pennsylvania volunteer men. And uh, Ord said, well, they were a little slow coming on, but once they got into it, they were just fine. So it's a, it's a good, good omen to come. The next action will be probably this in the Battle of Fredericksburg will be the Pennsylvania Reserve's most, uh, most telling fights. Now, General George B. McClellan had commanded, took command of the Army of the Potomac shortly after Bull Run in 1861 and did not move, did not do anything. The Army gathered around Washington and McClellan's army is, is pretty good size. I mean, it, it's, a, it's over 100,000 men. And the Confederate army is struggling to put it up together to defend uh, Richmond, which they have obviously Richmond will be the target for all Union armies. So McClellan in the spring of 1862, much of General, uh, excuse me, President Lincoln's urging, proposed a plan where the Army of the Potomac would move down the Potomac River to the Chesapeake Bay, and then land at Fort Monroe. Fort Monroe was still in Union hands, even though the rest of Virginia was not. And the army then would, the plan was the army would move up this peninsula toward Richmond, much easier than going overland across, you know, the Rappahannock, the Rapidan, different rivers that had to be crossed. Go by water, use the York River and the James River to support their flanks and bring up supplies. So by the end of June, 1862, we have the Army of the Potomac on the outskirts of Richmond. Now they can see church spires, they can hear courthouse clocks and hear church bells ringing, they're that close. Um, McClellan is a whole nother talk. George McClellan was a master of an army, the men loved him, but McClellan seemed reluctant to use his Army of the Potomac. Now the Pennsylvania reserves will be left in the defenses of Washington at first, and then we'll move overland toward the peninsula via Fredericksburg, but only one division, um, McCall's Pennsylvania division, the part of the first Corps, the rest of the first Corps will end up out in the Shenandoah Valley and will get kicked around by Stonewall Jackson and about everybody else out there. But um, McCall's division will move overland to Fredericksburg and then on to the, to the outskirts of Richmond. And it'll be here at Mechanicsville on the 26th of June, 1862, that they find themselves holding a defensive position overlooking Beaver Dam Creek. And they go into a position, it's got great, it's a great position. It's a small hill with a little creek at the bottom. They felled trees so that the tops of the trees headed toward the Confederates forming a natural abatis and the artillery on top of the small hill. It's not much when you go there to look at it, but uh, as a guide once told me at Gettysburg, you don't need much high ground to be on high ground. So, especially in the Civil War. So they, um, they will take up positions here at Mechanicsville. Mechanicsville, interesting name. Just a few blacksmith shops and a couple of iron, small iron foundries there. So that made it a mechanic. So a mechanic was anybody who worked with machinery. Uh, here on the outskirts of Richmond and Robert E. Lee, um, by the fact that the Confederate General Joe Johnson has been wounded, Lee is given command. Now Lee decides he will try to knock McClellan away from Richmond in a series of blows hoping to use Stonewall Jackson's troops and the troops here he has with him 
Jackson has just come from the Shenandoah Valley campaign and he and his men are physically exhausted. And their performance in the, at least the first couple of battles here is gonna be somewhat sluggish. Um, so at the Battle of Mechanicsville, AP Hill is supposed to attack and generally Confederate General AP Hill and he's supposed to uh, wait for Jackson to attack on his left Well, Jackson doesn't, he doesn't hear Jackson's guns. He has no communication from Jackson. So he'll attack on his own and is handily repulsed by the McCall's Pennsylvania Reserve Division. They held a great position, but that night they were told to withdraw. And with the rest of the army, they withdraw to Gaines Mill, another really good position, a hillside overlooking a small creek, Boston Swamp, Boston's Creek, and they will be put in reserve. The next day, the 27th, I believe, I believe 20, no, yeah, 27th of June, 1862, Lee will attack. Again, AP Hill starts at four o'clock in the afternoon. They attack, and uh, McClellan's force here, it's mainly the Fifth Army Corps, General Morrell, and they are, they're strained. Um, they're, they're struggling to hold on. Uh, the attacks are getting stronger and stronger. So the reserves are sent in piecemeal. One regiment at a time is sent here and there along the line to fill gaps and to, to help out. Um, I take pride in the fact that my great great grandfather was captured on the same day that General uh, Reynolds was captured. The 11th Reserves, which my great great grandfather belonged to, and I'm trying not to talk anymore about my family, but um, with the entire regiment and the 4th New Jersey were captured. And then later, early the next morning, Reynolds and his staff, who had hid in the woods uh, in here, southern voices all around them and Reynolds looks at the staff and says well I guess that's it and they sort of stood up and were taken prisoner and later Confederate General I think it was D.H. Hill said to Reynolds no shame Reynolds it's the fate of war so Reynolds goes off to a hotel in Richmond to spend his time in, in, in captivity but the army would retreat backward towards Savage's station where the reserves do not take part and then they move on to Fraser's Farm and Newmarket Crossroads. Now, Newmarket Crossroads is that battle has seven or eight names, maybe not that many, but um, more probably more commonly known as Glendale. But the reserves call it Newmarket Crossroads in their uh, history written shortly after the war, two volume history of the Pennsylvania Reserves. They always refer to it as Newmarket Crossroads. And what happens here, it seems pretty clear that the reserves under McCall go into position and the rest of the Army of the Potomac is retreating to their rear. But McCall's division was supposedly attached to John Porter's Fifth Corps. I, I guess I misspoke early and said Morrell's Fifth Corps. Morrell commanded a division. So they, they thought they were part of Fitz John Porter's Fifth Corps, but Porter didn't send them any orders, didn't treat them as though they were. So the Confederates will attack the reserves line at Newmarket Crossroads the next day, and it is one of the one of the bloodier fights of their of their career, especially on the peninsula. Um, General uh, Meade is wounded. He is uh, wounded in the, in the lung, a bad a bad wound. Uh, Truman Seymour, who is replaced Ord, is seen walking hatless and dazed. And on foot, it almost seems as though he's been thrown from a horse. Um, so it's not a good, good day, they, but they do hold. Re repeated Confederate attacks and they do hold. And the whole army will pull back then to Malvern Hill. And General McCall was also captured at Malvern Hill. Funny story, he rides into the woods. You know, it's dark now and he rides off down a, a wood road. You can see the trees covering the road making it even darker. And a soldier stepped out of the woods and said, um, or McCall said, whose command is this? And the, the soldier said, General Fields, sir. And McCall said, I don't know him. And <laughs> grabbed the reins as to ride away. And the Confederate grabbed the reins and they put a bayonet to him and said, not so fast. So uh, he will also go as a prisoner. So 
it doesn't seem as though this is going so well. The Army of the Potomac, though, moves back to a position at Malvern Hill, and they will hold their massive artillery barrage, um, help from the gunboats in the James River, and that will bring an end to the Seven Days Battles. And the reserves have suffered very heavy casualties, including Meade, who has returned to his home in Philadelphia to recover. He had obtained, and this is a, when you tell, talk about George Meade, you have to talk about his horse. Now, most of these generals had more than one horse. Meade also had another horse named Blackie, but old Baldy, Meade had a special affection for, and so did the troops, it seems. He got that white blaze on his forehead, on his, it's on his snout. He's got four white uh, hooves. And um, he had belonged to General David Hunter and had been wounded at first bull run a uh, shell fragment or bullet grazed his snout. Um, but Meade would comment often on what a brave old soul Baldy was and what a, what a good war horse Baldy was. And the middle photograph um, shows Baldy's head. And I'll tell the story here. It's actually a post-war story. Baldy survives being wounded four times throughout the course of the war. He was hit in the stomach at Gettysburg. He left for dead at Antietam and wandered back to camp. And um, he's, you know, uh, that's something to keep in mind. These horses are, are big targets and they, they take a lot of bullets throughout the course of the war. But Baldy survives the war. Meade basically after Gettysburg had him put out to pasture. Uh, he will be at a farm uh, somewhere near Philadelphia, Jenkintown, and he cared for, nursed back to health, and then he, he recovers, and he will pull Meade's, uh, the wagon carrying Meade's casket or caisson in his funeral in 1872. Now, later, Baldy, you know, treated, revered, and treated like the hero that uh, Meade was, um, he will, he's fading, so that they put him down, and um, the way they did it is a kind of a morbid story, but he's buried. And not long after, two members of the Philadelphia uh, GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, two veterans of the Army of the Potomac, decided that that was no way for Baldy to go. So they dug him up, and uh, I don't know how much liquor was involved. They dug him up, severed his head, and took it to a taxidermist and had him mounted. And uh, Baldy has been mounted for quite some time. He, is, he was in the Mollus Museum, the Military Order of the Loyal Legion in Philadelphia. He's now in the GAR Museum in Philadelphia. But the statue on the right is Meade at Gettysburg, and he is mounted on old Baldy. Now, Meade will recover from his uh, wound in time to return to the battles of Second Bull Run and then Tatum at Second Bull Run, uh, the Pennsylvania Reserves will basically will sort of uh, form a line so the rest of the Army can retreat. Now, there are other units involved in this too, but they take great pride in this. But when we now go to the Battle of South Mountain in September of 1862, and then the bloody cornfield, the Battle of Antietam, the Pennsylvania Reserves uh, now commanded by George Meade in the first corps under General Joseph Hooker will fight in the bloody cornfield. And students of the Civil War, though there were many cornfields in the Civil War, there was only one, the cornfield. And everyone knows this is Antietam. And they will fight a back and forth fight in the cornfield, but will clear it, but suffer very heavy casualties. Hooker is wounded. Meade is notified that he is in now in command of the first corps for a temporary for a short time, but he'll revert to division command. The next major battle that the Army of the Potomac and the Pennsylvania Reserves are involved in is the Battle of Fredericksburg, December of 1862. Now, I like to say, and I know George has heard my talk at Fredericksburg on the reserves, I like to say there are two battles of Fredericksburg. One, is the famous slaughter here in front of Marie's Heights, just outside of the city of Fredericksburg, which everyone knows about, which accomplished 
nothing except a large number of Union casualties. But here on the southern end of the battlefield, the left grand division, General Franklin, will cross the Rappahannock and will face Stonewall Jackson's troops. Now, seeing uh, the chance, Franklin, an unimaginative officer at best, was ordered to send at least one division. Well, when you're unimaginative, what do you do? You send one division. So he sent Meade's provision of the Pennsylvania Reserves, Reynolds Corps commander, will send them toward Jackson's line. And Meade advances, but is plagued by artillery fire here from John Pelham's guns on his left. Pelham, the gallant Pelham, the young man uh, with just a, a small number of guns will slow up Meade's advance, but they advance and they found a spot in Jackson's line that was lightly defended. It was a swampy area in front of it and they broke through. They broke Stonewall Jackson's line while all of this other slaughter and carnage is going on up here on the right of the Union line. But if you read the Civil War, you've heard this a hundred times. We were forced to withdraw because we had no support. Nobody came to their assistance. You break through, you can cause the enemy to retreat, but the attack itself expends the energy of your troops. You need backup, you need reserve troops to come up and back you up and to, to uh, exploit the breach that you've created. Meade struggled very hard to get somebody to help him. He, he rode around, he ordered officers to send their troops up and the officers actually went up and told him, you can't give me orders. <laughs> you know, you're in a different division than I am. And Meade's like, come oh, on, somebody. After the fighting is over and they have all withdrawn, Meade runs into General Franklin the wing commander, right, right grand division, left grand division commander, as they called them. And Meade says to him, I had quite a bit of a fight up there today. And Franklin says, really? I, I didn't think the fight was that heavy on your front. Meade is supposed to have taken his hat off and put his finger through a bullet hole and said, I found it quite hot where I was. So, the Pennsylvania Reserves, George Meade, really equipped themselves well at Fredericksburg. Now we move to the spring of 1863. George Meade is promoted to Major General, commands the Fifth Army Corps of the Army of the Potomac. The commander is General Joseph Hooker, Fighting Joe. And things start off really well for the campaign. Hooker, Hooker restored morale. He brought better rations. He in, uh, instituted the system of core badges, which the army would wear a small two inch felt patch on their caps or some officers often had metal ones made. Um, I've seen ones that were made at Tiffany's in New York that were just beautiful, you know, but it was a source of pride, esprit de corps. It's the, really the predecessor of the patches that soldiers wear in their sleeves today. And, um, they will wear this with, with great pride. The Fifth Corps badge was a Maltese cross. And all the Fifth Corps here also included the 83rd Pennsylvania uh, from, uh, from Erie County and Garford County, I believe Mercer County, Warren County, Northwest Pennsylvania Regiment, 83rd. But Joe Hooker has a plan. He's going to cross the Rappahannock and the Rapidan River and get behind Lee, who is at Fredericksburg. So this map shows the plan. Here is Fredericksburg. Lee's army was basically where they had been in December. And Hooker plans to leave his camps around Falmouth, move up the river, cross, and come in. And now he would be behind Lee. All seems to be going according to plan as we get into May 2nd, May 1st, May 2nd, 1863. Now, this map is shows toward the end of the fighting, but I want to show you along here, along the, the Orange Turnpike. Meade's Fifth Corps, which is shown here, was advancing. They were pushing the Confederates before them when word came down to retreat back to Chancellorsville, which is sounds like a town. It's a house, a couple outbuildings, big plantation house, which is where Hooker's headquarters was. Meade said to the aide, you better be telling me the truth or I'll have you arrested. 
and the aide repeated that yes, the order is returned to Chancellorsville. And Meade, who had, and I will distress this here, Meade is known to have a very bad temper. His nickname is the old snapping turtle. And because he wore glasses, he's sometimes referred to as the goggle-eyed old snapping turtle. And there's a couple of other variations which improve, include profanity. But Meade will return with the Corps and they wait because Hooker <clears throat> seems to have given up, given up the initiative. And again, that's a whole other talk. And I think anyone <clears throat> will realize that what happened to Stonewall Jackson and his corps will slam into the Union 11th Corps here on the federal right, <coughs> excuse me, and roll up the army. <coughs> Before we get to Gettysburg, I'd like to point out to the location of the third corps under Sickles. Sickles felt he had a bad position, so he moved his corps out of line. He will do the same thing at Gettysburg in about two months. Gettysburg. It's the it's where the story of Meade begins to rise and also is, begins to go bad, I believe. On as the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's Army, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but as Lee's Red Army of Northern Virginia moves northward using the Shenandoah Valley and the, and the mountains, blue mounts to guard to, to uh, shield their movements. Hooker takes the Army of the Potomac and they begin to move parallel to him. Again, Hooker is under orders. He must protect Baltimore and Washington, Baltimore, Washington. And he hopes to be able to defend those places. Well, a series of uh, nasty dispatches back and forth between Hooker and Washington result in Hooker being removed from command. On the 27th of June, note that 27th of June, Two or three days before the Battle of Gettysburg, a courier from Washington arrived at Meade's tent in the middle of the night and placed him in command of the Army of the Potomac. Now, George Meade had written to his wife and other people that I have no political friends. You know, I'm never going to get the command. The story is they had offered the job to John Reynolds, who was Meade's friend. And Reynolds said, if you're not going to give me a free hand, I'm not going to take it. And there was some talk that Meade was recommended by Reynolds, but when the push came to shove, George Meade got the job as commander of the Army of the Potomac just a couple of days before the greatest battle ever fought on this continent and the turning point of the war in the East, for sure. Imagine that, courier knocks on your tent flap, how he knocked on the tent, I don't know, in the middle of the night, and Meade kind of said, I, I'm probably under arrest, right? <laughs> no, you're, you're got the Army like it or not. So what Meade decides he will do will be to continue basically what Hooker had been doing, which is to follow uh, Lee into Pennsylvania and try to protect Baltimore and Washington. Now, another controversy comes up here is what's called the Pipe Creek Circular. Pipe Creek is a area between West, near Westminster and uh, south of Hagerstown, which really afforded very good ground for a defense. For about a day and a half, the Pipe Creek Circular was the idea that the army, if they brought on contact with Lee, they would all fall back. The ones who are ahead of it, would, north of it, would fall back to Pipe Creek. Those south would come up to Pipe Creek and Lee would be forced to attack them uh, on very, very good ground out of their choosing. Much has been made about the Pipe Creek Circular that Meade did not want to fight at Gettysburg. I'm going to quote a student of mine, a senior in high school. When talking about this, he said, well, it's plan B, right? Yes, it's plan B, you know, from the mouths of babes. Um, it put it perfectly. Meade was prepared for a contingency if things did not go well at the fighting which will ensue in Pennsylvania. So on July 1st, Battle of Gettysburg, General John Reynolds, first commander of the first corps and a friend of, a friend of Meade's arrives, decides this is a good place to fight. He sends a message back to Meade that he'll hold the ground at all costs and he'll defend the town if need be. But Reynolds is killed only about a half hour, 40 minutes after coming onto the field. 
Meade then decided to send another officer that he trusted, General Winfield Scott Hancock, commander of the Second Corps, northward, to tell me if this is a good place to fight a battle. So Reynolds is dispatched. He gets a, excuse me, Hancock is dispatched. He gets into a, an ambulance, looks over maps, then mounts up and rides up into the cemetery here at Gettysburg, just as the remains of the Union 11th and 1st Corps, which have been badly defeated west of town, that they retreat back to. And conferring with General Howard, commander of the 11th Corps, determines, yes, this, this is a good place. This is good ground. We have high ground here, and we have a very good, very good chance to win. So he lets me know, yes, this is the place to fight. So the Pipe Creek Circular is out, out the window, basically. Now, the other officer I've included here will become Meade's nemesis in this. General Daniel E. Sickles, a New York politician, Tammany Hall uh, politician. He's the only one of the Corps commanders who's not a West Pointer. And um, he will pull a move here that is very similar to what he did at Chancellorsville on July 2nd. He wasn't sure about his position. I don't know, this is a map showing July 3rd, but Sickles line would have been in here, opposite the Peach Orchard and Wheatfield and Rose Woods. And about 3.30, General Meade sent his son, go down and find out if Sickles knows where he's supposed to be, which was basically in here where it says Bernie. And <clears throat> Sickles again said to the son, I, I don't know exactly where the general wants me. If he if he come down here, I can, I can, you know, go where he wants me to go. But he moved out. Sickles moved his entire corps a mile, about a mile out of line, like he had done at Chancellorsville. And when the Confederates under General Longstreet attack about four o'clock, who do they hit first? They hit Sickles. And Sickles is, is badly wounded. He will lose his leg and return to uh, home to New York to recuperate and to begin to cause trouble as far as uh, I'm concerned. Another controversy is the night of July 2nd. General Meade held a council of war at the Widow Leicester House on Cemetery, Cemetery Ridge. Poor, poor widow, poor Lydia Leicester, um, basically never got the money she deserved from the government claims that she placed. Uh, large number of dead horses in her front yard. Just this little, little farmhouse that was in the, about the center of the Union line on Cemetery Ridge that Meade chose for his headquarters. Um, greatly well located, but it'll be badly damaged by the fighting on July 2nd, especially July 3rd. Well, on the night of July 2nd, Meade called his Corps commanders or a division commander that could be sent to represent possibly a wounded Corps commander or dead Corps commander, such as Reynolds or Sickles, to his headquarters for a council of war. Now there's an old adage, um, councils of war don't fight. And Meade basically asked them three questions and they, they discussed this freely and openly and you know, set the scene here. It's July, it's hot, they're all wearing woolly uniforms. There's no air conditioning. The room is crowded, there's cigar smoke. And um, the basic idea was, should we attack? And a couple, a couple officers said, yes, I think we should attack. Others said, no, we should stay. Uh, should we retreat? No, stay. So the decision to stay and fight was made. And Meade had already been thinking about an offensive using the 5th and 6th Corps um, and the 2nd Corps. Now, that will not happen, but the, we'll see that he, he had planned to do that. But he decided they would wait and see what Lee did. As they left the Council of War, Meade stopped General John Gibbon, a division commander in Hancock's Second Corps. And he said, John, if Lee attacks tomorrow, it will be on your front, meaning the Union Center. And Gibbon said something, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, they have attacked my flanks today. Tomorrow they will attack my center, meaning the flanks of Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill and Little Round Top. Well, they do attack. Pickett's famous charge attacks the center of the Union line. It is repulsed. 
and then they begin the on July 4th in the rain, Lee's army, the night of July 4th, Lee's army will retreat. A wagon train of wounded 17 miles long. The Army of the Potomac is rightfully pleased that they have won a victory at Gettysburg. <clears throat> However, not everybody believes so. And here's where I believe Meade's troubles start. He made the mistake, I think you would say, of writing a proclamation to the army and he thanked them for their service. The enemy has def been defeated. And once they will cross, the Confederates would cross the Potomac back into Maryland, which again, Meade has been criticized for a slow sluggish pursuit of Lee back to the Potomac. Lincoln especially did not understand why he couldn't have got him. And Meade sends out this proclamation and says, the last vestige of the invader has been driven from our soil, which apparently really sent Lincoln through the roof. And he said, when will my generals understand it's all our soil? And he read, he wrote a fairly long letter to Meade in which he told him this. And he, um, you know, what would Dale Carnegie say? You know, it's definitely not something you wanted how to win, win friends and influence people. But he writes this letter and then he did what you should do and Lincoln put it in his desk. He didn't send it. You know, don't respond when you're mad, wait and do it the next day. Well, summer turns to fall in the campaigns at Bristow Station and Mine Run. Uh, Meade can't seem to get Lee where he wants him. Uh, one historian, one book called it Meandering with Meade, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat of a nasty term, but it's true. He just couldn't really pin Lee down. Um, General Hancock, one of his trusted corps commanders, was wounded at Gettysburg on July 3rd and is really not the same. He will never be the same after, after his Gettysburg wound. But out west, this man, Ulysses S. Grant, had won at Vicksburg, and his star is on the rise. This man, Snidely Whiplash, or excuse me, Dan Sickles, is back in New York, nursing his wounds, his lost leg, and his reputation. So now we move to what I refer to as Historicus and Grant. Sickles, no doubt, with the help of somebody from his staff, began to write letters to the newspapers. Long, long letters. Letters we wouldn't read today because it's too long. And he criticized <clears throat> General Meade's generalship at Gettysburg. Um, Meade had, will decide later to that fall to disband the Third Corps. And that was Sickles' baby. Well, disbanded, but he had to disband other ones too because of the heavy casualties at Gettysburg. And then in the spring of 1865, General Grant, Hero of the West is made general in chief of the all Union armies. Now, Meade, this is something a lot of people don't understand. Meade retains command of the Army of the Potomac, but he will have a shadow over him the entire time, and that is U.S. Grant. Grant will decide for the spring campaign of 1864, he will make his headquarters with the Army of the Potomac. Now, I used to say to my students, that would be like having the principal sit in here every day. You know, you have the boss sitting, watching what you do all the time. And Meade at first was gracious. He went to Grant and offered to resign. Perhaps Grant would like to put someone else in charge that, um, that he was more comfortable with, say a Sherman or a Sheridan that he worked with in the West. And Grant wrote that he, had thought about replacing me, but he was so impressed with his courtly behavior and gentlemanly attitude that he, he decided to keep him on. As we move to the spring campaign, which will, in many ways, it was called the Overland Campaign of 1864. It begins very much like the Chancellorsville Campaign, they will cross the river. Um, Meade gives the orders, but Grant has the big picture. Grant gives the big picture orders, Meade gives the tactical on the ground orders as to what we're gonna do, who's gonna move for where. Heavy fighting in the wilderness, heavy casualties. But the difference here is the Army of the Potomac doesn't retreat back across the Rappahannock and the Rapidan. They move by the flank and they move toward the next fight 
the big one at Spotsylvania Courthouse, which will take several days. The Union forces or Confederate forces, excuse me, are dug in in a large entrenched position, heavy casualties. But um, as this campaign progresses, Meade has run afoul of a powerful Philadelphia reporter. That reporter is Edward Cropsey. Cropsey in the Philadelphia Inquirer had written during that campaign that um, Meade, Meade's responses were slow. Um, Grant was the true leader here, on and on and on. And there's a multitude of things that Cropsey said. And I see we're pushing eight o'clock here, so I'm moving then. But Meade called him to his headquarters and said, what are you talking about? And I, uh, explain yourself, explain yourself. And Cropsey just said, well, you know, it's pretty well known that Grant running things now. So Meade, can you imagine this today? Meade banned him from the army, had him drummed out of the camp by the uh, provost, provost marshal, the MPs, and had him drummed out of camp and he had a sign around his neck as a libeler and slander. And all of the other reporters who followed the army decided they would not cover Meade anymore. Um, any bad thing that happened, Meade would get covered. If something good happened, Grant got the credit. So you can tell now why Meade had very little good to say about the press and the media. Plus, he has General Grant right there. And as the campaign went on into 1864, the siege at Petersburg, which will last months, uh, which won't break up until the spring of 65, Grant begins to take a more aggressive um, role in running things. Well, April, first week of April, 1865, all will break up. Um, Lee's army has been losing men to desertion, to illness. The Army of the Potomac has been supplemented by the Army of the James, uh, their heavy, heavy cavalry forces, and they're ready for spring. Well, they will cut off the, one of the last railroads leading into Petersburg, which was a rail center that supplied Richmond. So if you can see that a trench system ran all the way from Richmond to Petersburg on both sides. Well, uh, the Union forces were able to get around that and Lee has no, no choice but to retreat to the West. There are a series of battles, most notably Sailor's Creek. And, um, but on April 8th, April 9th, 1865, General Lee is cut off. He can't make it further West and he sends a white flag through the lines and will meet with Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. I, I always choose this, this painting done by the National Geographic Society, I believe during the war, the centennial in the early 1960s. Um, it seems to capture the moment though there is one person in the painting who wasn't there and that's George Custer. Custer showed up a little after the proceeding started, bounded up onto the porch and some of Grant's staff said, no, 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 you, you can't go in. So it's probably a good thing that, uh, that he did not go in. But we see here that famous scene of uh, Lee in his best uniform and his secretary surrendering to the mud spattered General Grant. And um, it's very, um, very American scene. You know, the, the aristocracy surrenders to the common man. And the Civil War ends and George Meade was not present at Appomattox. He was not far away. Uh, he got the word that Lee had surrendered. Uh, they rewrote the lines, waving his hat. Soldiers cheered him. They obviously knew who he was. I think they were just glad to go home. We will see the war end, the bloodshed end, but the Civil War will end for George Meade and for the rest of them as well here in the East. <clears throat> in the days following, Meade's um, wife, relative was a Confederate general, General Wise. And of course, there is an intermingling between Union and Confederate officers in the days where both armies are still around Appomattox working out the paroles. So Meade sought out Wise, and he also ran into General Lee. And Lee said something to him about, your hair is grayer than I remember it being. Something George says to me on a regular basis. And Meade responded, you have to answer for most of it. Meaning you, you gave me fits in the last three years, four years here. 
So this is General Meade and his staff. Uh, I didn't mention his General Butterfield being his original staff, uh, chief of staff, but that'll be for another talk. Butterfield. But I love that line. You have you have to answer for most of it. So old friends from the old army, you know, people who maybe hadn't seen each other for some time but knew each other as young men. Uh, we'll try to seek each other out during those days at Appomattox. The post-war years, staff jobs, the United States Army divides the South into departments, divides the whole country actually into departments. Um, Meade commanded a different military districts and department. Meade commanded a number of them, um, but he continues to face this issue that he is not really represented well by the press. He is not, um, Grant gets the attention, um, no doubt. Grant and Sherman uh, get the lion's share of the attention. And these, these posts, these uh, military division of the Atlantic and, uh, you know, he worked, he did take part in the, in the stopping the Fenian raids on the Canadian border. Uh, you know, it, it's not commanding the Army of the Potomac. And George Meade, shown here, colorized photograph. Um, he's, I think he suffered from that. And he, he's, he's quoted as saying, I have great contempt for history. And I think that that really sums up how he felt about how he would be remembered. His letters to his wife are, are very telling. And there's a good way to always, you can always as a historian, if the general or president or whoever's married, find somebody he confides into like his wife. And Meade's letters to his wife are, are a treasure trove of information about his true feelings. He even mentioned Baldy in the first letter he wrote after Gettysburg. He mentioned to letter to, to Margaret, he mentioned Baldy, the old fellow's doing pot. But um, he will die on November 6th, 1872, at age 56 of pneumonia. Um, he is buried at Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. And his headstone reads, and I hate to read to people, but his headstone reads, George Gordon Meade, Major General of the United States Army, born at Cadiz, Spain, the 1st, 1815, died of Philadelphia. He did his work bravely and at and is at rest. I, I That's fitting. The man probably did not get the recognition he deserved, but he's recognized statues at Gettysburg, um, monuments in, in Washington, his grave in Philadelphia. So we remember him. I know that we Civil War people, we, we know who George Meade was. Well, that ends my presentation on George Meade. Anyone who wishes to contact me with different questions that you may not send to Ben tonight, you can contact me at, at jsherry at eriehistory.org. Again, I am Jeff Sherry, the museum educator at the Hagen History Center. Now I'll turn it over to Ben and George. If you have any questions, I'll do what I can to answer them. So Jeff, I'm gonna jump in here and I'm gonna uh, go straight to the comment section and read the one that I see first that says, thank you for this. So uh, a big round of applause, uh, digitally, virtually, collectively, as we're watching this, I, I do wanna thank you for that. I, I share that sentiment with that viewer, uh, Jeff. So we're grateful. I know we're a little pressed for time, almost out of it, but I want to sneak in a question um, because here we've talked about the forgotten hero and, and, and some have forgotten him, not all have. You've done some tremendous research to unpack his life and help bring in uh, more people into the fold to know about uh, General George Gordon Meade. How did you uh, initially get interested in studying him more in depth? What drew you in, Jeff, to, to get you to research uh, such a man, such a life and such a contributor to the Civil War? Well, I'd like to thank all those people or folks who are viewing, uh, and I'd like to thank you, Ben, for giving us this opportunity. What drew me to Mead was, as a kid, a little kid, um, what do you study? You just the Battle of Gettysburg, first battlefield we went to. Well, George Meade was the commander of the Union Army. All right. Well, then, as I got older, I recognized his importance, his in my teens, his what he had done, and then. When I find out, and again, I was in my teens when I find out that my great-great-grandfather had been in 
the division that he had commanded and fought at the Army of the Potomac. Then I started to really look into, into George Meade. Um, and then further study of Gettysburg and all the things. I mean, there have been books written about Meade's plans, uh, articles about what Meade planned to do. And I think that's a whole other talk, but um, he didn't just sit and wait for Lee. He, okay, I agree. His, his pursuit was somewhat sluggish, um, but his army, he, his officers were tired, very tired. He has suffered a large number of uh, generals and colonels who have been killed and wounded. So I just found that Meade was a very interesting character, especially when you realize that so many people who aren't real big Civil War buffs do not know who he was. I appreciate that, Jeff. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't pitch over uh, to my co-host here, Mr. George Deitch, uh, to sneak one question here in at the end before we break for this program. So, George, over to you. Jeff, as you know, one of the big controversies at Gettysburg um, was after Pickett's charge had failed, the Union had repulsed it. Um, did Meade plan to attack Lee on July 3rd? Yes. And why did yes, he? Well, he did. And the explanation is, I'll tell you why, what the plan was and why it didn't come up to be and why it didn't come to be is somewhat of a lame answer. But uh, what he had intended to do, and he had expressed this to Hancock. Hancock testified about this at his, uh, at the committee, Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War hearings that were held well after Gettysburg, which basically was to investigate Gettysburg and Meade comes out pretty well in them. Actually, they, they sort of say, well, you know, you could have done this, could have done that, but they didn't, didn't recommend his removal or anything. And the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War is very powerful. But Hancock said that Meade had communicated to him that if he planned to use the Second Corps, which is in the center of Meade's line, to go forward and break the, the remnants of Pickett's and Pettigrew's men and then the 5th and 6th Corps would attack Lee's right flank, what amounts to the area south of, um, or excuse me, east, west of Little Round Top uh, and the area of the wheat field and would attack Lee's flank. Well, it doesn't happen. Um, Hancock is wounded. Uh, several, as I said earlier, several generals are wounded. Colonels, brigade, division commanders are wounded or killed. And the ground south, as you well know, having walked it, that ground in the Plum Run area is extremely rough. It looks like a like a field, but it's rocks in there, and it, it, it's not it's not a good not good ground uh, to attack. Even though the fifth and sixth, fifth and sixth corps were in a position to do this, had Hancock gone into the center, fifth and sixth corps move around on the Confederate flank, it it, it, it may have worked. It may have worked. They were the Confederates were just as uh, shot, more shot up, possibly than Meade's army was, and had less men. So it, it could have worked, but you you don't count Bobby Lee out. Jeff, I want to thank you for that. Um, uh, appreciate that answer. Appreciate you taking the time. Your contact information is there on the screen. Jay Sherry at eriehistory.org for folks that want to ask more questions. Tune in to this topic. Uh, figure out ways to engage in, in the conversation around General Meade more. Uh, but I'm going to echo more comments I'm seeing right now in the comments section. Mr. Jeff Sherry, thank you so much for taking the time, energy, and effort on this research and for sharing it with us here in this special partnership event between the Erie Civil War Roundtable, the Hagen History Center, and the JES. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're most welcome, and thank you for the opportunity. And of course, to all of you watching along at home, tuning in in real time, watching it live on the JES Facebook page or the Hagen History Center Facebook page, thank you for tuning in. Those catching a later broadcast, watching this, uh, streaming it on demand, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Jeff, for folks, uh, again, we've got your contact information up there. The website for the Hagen History Center is, remind folks where we can point them to? www.eriehistory.org. Fantastic. And George, for folks looking to learn more about Erie's Civil War Roundtable, where might we point them? Well, I'll point you right to uh, Jeff's email. If anybody is interested, we, uh, we meet seven times a year. Um, have been doing it virtually, of course, this year. Um, but it's a, it's a good study group. 
or people interested, and they don't have to be scholars. All they have to do is, is be willing to sit down for an hour and listen to a good lecture like we just had. So if anybody has a question on, on the uh, round table, um, get a hold of Jeff and he'll pass it along. Absolutely. Fantastic. And we do have another program coming up next month featuring Mr. George Deitch. He's going to be talking to us uh, in February, another partnership event. We're already looking forward to that. Uh, for more information on that, as well as other upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and joint partnerships with places like the Hagen History Center and the Erie Civil War Roundtable, you can head over to jeserie.org. There you're also going to find a past discussion archived uh, where you can stream those videos and programs on demand at your leisure. You can also find a whole wide range of publications from timely reads on current topics to reports, essays, and more. And of course, be sure to find us on Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and go find the Hagen History Center on all of those platforms as well. On behalf of the Erie Civil War Roundtable and the Hagen History Center, and for the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.